Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Wall, and I'm the director of the School of Global Environmental Sustainability at Colorado State University. And I'm the chairperson of this National Academy Study Committee. In my role as chair of this study and as the moderator of this committee meeting, I'd like to welcome everyone here on Zoom. And for those watching you, watching the live stream and all of you who may watch the recording later, we're really glad that you're able to see this webinar. The task being undertaken by this committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine is to explore the linkages between soil health and human health. The committee's full statement of tasks can be found on the study website, which is available at the link under project to the right of the embedded video of this meeting. I would like to give some sense of the format of today's meeting. I have a few housekeeping comments to make, and then I will turn things over to Carolini, the study director with the National Academies, to provide a brief overview of the study process. Following her presentation, I will introduce our speakers today. We will adjourn the meeting at one o'clock Eastern time or when our conversation is complete, whichever comes first. To start, I want to note that this is an open on record session. Interested individuals and members of the press have been invited to join as observers. This is not a news conference, however, and we will not be entertaining questions from the audience. Reporters who would like to talk with members of the committee are kindly asked to touch base with a staff officer, Kara Laney, and also anyone who would like to submit a written comment or a document to the committee to be examined is welcome to do so by clicking the provide feedback link on the right side of the study uh, website. You can also subscribe for updates about the study by signing up in the National Academy's Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources listserv, also on the right side of the page. I would like to remind everyone that this is an information gathering session. That is, the committee is in the process of assembling materials that they will examine and discuss in the course of making its findings, conclusions, and recommendations. And that it would be a mistake for anyone to leave the meeting today thinking otherwise. Comments made by the individuals, including members of the committee, should not be interpreted as positions of the committee or the academies. In addition, committee members typically ask probing questions in these information gathering sessions that may not be indicative of their personal views. The committee will deliberate thoroughly before writing its draft report. Moreover, once the draft report is written, it must go through a rigorous review by experts who are anonymous to the committee, and the committee must then respond to this review with appropriate revisions that adequately satisfy the Academy's Report Review Committee and the NAS president before it is considered an official Academy report. This committee is composed of 15 volunteer experts, and I emphasize volunteer experts, and their names are listed on your screen. You can find a biography, a short biography of each of these on our study website. I'd now like to turn things over to Carol Laney, the Senior Program Officer with the Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources at the Natural, National Academies and the Study Director for this activity. Carol will give us a brief overview of the National Academies study process. Thanks, Diana. I just wanted to share a few words about the National Academies for anyone joining us today who, not be, who may not be familiar with the institution. The National Academy of Sciences was established in a bill passed by Congress and signed into law by President Lincoln in 1863. Later, the Academy was granted the authority to establish the National Academy of Engineering and the Institute of Medicine, which today is known as the National Academy of Medicine. So today we're the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and the, and the organization consists of these three honorific bodies, as well as the work of scientists across the country inside and outside the academies who provide expert advice to the nation on issues involving science, engineering, and medicine. The mission detailed in the Congressional Charter is to investigate, examine, experiment, and report upon any subject of science or art whenever called upon by the federal government. We fulfill this mission through many convening activities, including consensus studies like the one we're gathered for today. 
Just to share a little bit more about consensus studies, which are different from our other convening activities, such as workshops and forums, consensus studies are conducted by committees convened specifically for a unique statement of task. The experts who serve on these committees do so as individuals, not as representatives of any organization or institution to which they may belong. And as Diana said, they serve as volunteers. Consensus study committees review the state of the scientific literature to write a report that responds to a problem identified in the statement of task. The report will hopefully be used to shape sound policies, inform public opinion, and advance the pursuit of, science, of the scientific field in question. Each consensus study goes through a number of stages. The first, in, in the first stage, the statement of task is defined with the study sponsor. In this case, the study sponsor is USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Next, the National Academy asks for nominations to identify individuals with a requisite experience to respond to the statement of task. Each committee should be comprised of individuals with an appropriate range of expertise, as well as contain a balance of perspectives on the task's questions. Nominees are appointed to a committee by the president of the National Academy of Sciences, Dr. Marsha McNutt, and committee membership is provisional until the committee has completed a discussion of conflict of interest, disclosures, and composition at its early meetings. After being appointed, the committee moves into its information gathering phase, which is the part of the study process that we're in right now. The committee invites in speakers to present either in person or via Zoom. Members of the public may also submit information to the for the committee to consider. And as it gathers information, the committee will also begin deliberating on how best to address the statement of task, and then later begin drafting a, a report. When the draft report is complete, it's submitted to the National Academy's Report Review Committee and must be reviewed by uh, peers with similar expertise to those on the committee to provide uh, constructive criticism. The committee then takes those draft, those reviewer comments, responds to them, revises the draft report, and resubmits it to the National Academy's Report Review Committee. When that committee decides that the report has been appropriately revised in response to reviewer comments. The report is re approved for, for release, delivered to the sponsors, and made publicly available. I just want to say a few more, um, more words about the specifics of information gathering meetings during the committee process. When the committee hears from speakers, like we're doing today, we meet in open session. Anyone from the public may watch the presentations, and if we're meeting in person, they may attend in person as well. The committee meets in closed session to deliberate the statement of task and devise the best plan to address it. When the committee is meeting in closed session, only committee members and staff from the National Academies are present. This is the general timeline for the Soil Health and Human Health Study. Today is our sixth public meeting. We have three or four more public meetings planned for July. The next one will be July 10th and will feature a talk on the human microbiome. Information about that meeting is available on the study's website under upcoming events. I anticipate that the draft report will be ready to enter review this fall and that the final report will be released in the spring of 2024. Um, as Diana mentioned, you can find more information about the study by clicking on the link under project um, on, next to the embedded video. And that will take you to the study's homepage that includes the statement of task. And Kat, if you go to the next slide, you can find the complete statement of task there. And as I said, USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture is the sponsor. And the study came through USDA because of a congressional request in the last appropriations legislation. Finally, here's a screenshot of the study's website. On the left, you can see the tabs to the full statement of tasks, the committee members' names and bios. And on the right, there's a link to provide feedback and to sign up for our listserv to hear about upcoming events about the study. If you need to connect with the National Academy staff for the study, my email address is here, as well as that of my colleague, Catherine Kane. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Diane. Thank you very much, Kara. And again, welcome to everyone. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Matthias Rulig. Matias earned a PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis and San Diego State University in 1997. After a postdoc at the Carnegie Institute of Washington at Stanford, he joined the faculty of the University of Montana 
And in 2007, he relocated to the Free University of Berlin. His lab work works, I'm sorry, his lab works on soil ecology and how it is affected by factors of global change, including research on novel pollutants such as microplastics. Matthias, thank you for being with us today. Thanks very much, Diana. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and good afternoon from Berlin. I've been asked to talk about uh, microplastic and will do so. I will focus on actually microplastic in the first half of the talk, and then I'll broaden the scope to actually multiple global change factors that also include microplastic, because I believe that's very important for understanding the effects of uh, factors such as microplastic on soil health, and then potentially also for human health. And it also incidentally follows the path that our own research has taken. Well, basically, uh, plastic is a problem that I think um, people in Europe at least are very, very familiar with. It's uh, everywhere in the press, and it's maybe a little bit more so for the ocean than for the soil, where it's been an issue much more recently. Basically, the problem is related to the fact that plastic have, make, have made our life much easier uh, several decades ago and has basically enabled this throwaway living lifestyle where people don't need to do the dishes. You can just toss it away in this delightful photograph here from 1955. But what that has, of course, led to is we have really thrown away uh, a lot of plastic where in the environment it may degrade further into microplastic. And overall, it's estimated that about 6,300 million tons of waste have been produced in the last several decades. And a lot of that is in the, on the continents, um, in addition to in the ocean. And of course, there, a lot of it in turn is going to be in the soil. That is because there is a number of pathways via which plastic and microplastic can get into the soil. And it's actually a focus of much of the research on microplastic during the last few years um, to look at agriculture as this point of entry that is most severe. That is because in addition to aerial deposition that will happen basically anywhere on the planet, even where no human has ever set foot on this particular location, there will still be microplastic raining down from the air. There is, of course, discarded plastic litter that can then fragment further into microplastic size. And there's tire abrasion as a, as a major source of microplastic in the environment. But there's also specific sources for uh, agriculture, for example, plastic mulching in certain um, types of agriculture, or other agricultural products, or the addition of compost or sewage sludge. Uh, and that has basically led to agriculture being a hotspot of research for microplastic, which is, of course, important because it's where we grow our food. Now, um, microplastic in soil has a number of effects. It affects a number of soil parameters, most notably structure. What you see here is a photograph of a soil aggregate about two, four millimeter in size. And the blue things you see sticking out of it are microplastic fibers. And as a consequence, there's also a number of ecosystem process rates affected. What I want to highlight are just four points in the next four slides. The first point is this accumulation of microplastic in ecosystems may lead to feedbacks to the Earth system. That is actually not on very many people's radar, but it's very clear that microplastic in soil in part via affecting soil structure and soil aggregates can lead to changes in greenhouse gas emissions. And that can then lead to different concentrations of these gases in the atmosphere if this effect is more widespread and significant enough, which we do not know yet. Uh, there is, a, in addition, another of a, a range of other process rates affected in the soil. So you can imagine if soil structure is being changed and the microbiome. And there's also effects on plants, which again, if significant enough at a broad scale, can have um, drawdown effects for CO2 from the atmosphere, so the, the reverse effect, basically. Well, these effects on plants are quite interesting and have been also studied quite a bit, initially with a focus on whether microplastic can be taken up into plants. While that seems fundamentally possible via the crack entry mode <laughs> during uh, side root initiation, it's probably not a major pathway, is my personal um, 
take on this because um, in soil, soil is basically just massive surface. And many of these experiments have been done in hydroponic culture, where it's basically nowhere for these particles to go except for attach to the root and try to get in. But it is possible. And smaller pieces yet, smaller pieces than microplastic, namely nanoplastic pieces, can probably gain entrance in the root and then also be translocated within the plant. And this has been shown experimentally. Uh, what is less clear is what are the effects of nutritional quality. We have some indication that there are changes in nutritional quality, and I suspect some of the European projects of which we are also part here will focus on that in just the next few years. There's also effects on some key symbiosis like a vascular mycorrhizae that have, we, we have repeatedly seen that also basically suggest that there could be uh, nutritional quality consequences for, let's say, crops. That's, of course, of interest. The third point is that maybe right now we are not seeing the main effects of microplastic yet in terms of its toxicity. The reasoning goes like this. When we now throw away this plastic cup, that plastic material will fragment over time into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually re reaching microplastic size of so five millimeter or one millimeter, and then eventually even reading, reaching a nanoplastic size. Uh, when, when something is nanoplastic size, then it becomes um, much more uh, directly toxic to many organisms because these uh, particles can pass biological membranes. But another thing that happens, and it is very interesting and specific to this particular pollutant, is that it is a particle. As a particle, it has an internal volume. And within that internal volume, diffusion takes pl place of substances that are contained within these particles. Now, you all know these substances. They're the so-called additives, like plasticizers. They can also be colors and flame retardants and a myriad of uh, different uh, components. And as the particles get smaller, the diffusion path for these internally located uh, substances, all these additives become shorter and they're much more readily released into the environment. We've shown that in experiments that if you wash plastic particles um, and offer them to say like soil nematodes, then um, they are no longer toxic. Whereas before, if you had not washed them, they are very toxic. But if you leave these particles then sitting around in soil for like a week or two, and then offer them to nematodes again, they are again toxic. And the reason is that during this time, <laughs> um, these substances inside of the particles had an opportunity to diffuse to the surface of this particle and then, uh, and then be released again into the environment. So if we put this together um, in the long term, there might be this, what we've called uh, a, a toxicity debt in the future as these particles fragment further and further in the environment and release more and more of these typically quite toxic um, additive compounds, then we might actually look at the peak of toxicity in the future. We don't know if this is going to happen, but um, I hope not. <laughs> but I think this is currently uh, where we're at. The last effect I want to talk about here is microbiome changes, which I think is probably quite relevant for the work of the committee here. Uh, the plastisphere is the uh, name for the soil or the plastic surfaces that are immediately influenced by the plastic is enriched in a number of organisms. The, the plastisphere actually microbial community is quite different from that in the bulk soil or in other soil compartments because it is a specific surface. Um, but very often it's hydrophobic and uh, typically there's all this additive leaching out and that leads to most likely this being a rather stressful environment. But what it has led to is basically the enrichment of um, potential bacterial pathogens here from genomic work. You can see that in almost all these three different soils here, there is an, um, an increase compared to the bulk soil in the um, abundance of pathogenic organisms. And at the same time, in the same study, also done for various different types of plastic, which are these abbreviations you can see, see here and for three totally different soil types, you can see there's also an enrichment of antibiotic resistance genes. And of course, that together <laughs> is not a particularly good combination. 
And this has also been observed before and is also known more from aquatic environments. And this is sort of the first report of that more from the soil. And we recently, this is a review paper coming out uh, January of 2024, when we look at all these plastosphere microbiome effects. And there's quite a few, this, uh, they are actually beginning to be quite well documented now. So there's really changes in the soil microbiome and also in the microbiome uh, on the surfaces of these plastics. Now, um, I'm halfway through, and I want to stop here just talking about only microplastic by pointing out that microplastic is really just one facet of global change. And uh, this was, I think, very nicely, unfortunately, uh, illustrated by the uh, pandemic, where there is all these interwoven factors at play. Like during the pandemic, there was an increased plastic use that at least led to increased microplastic pollution, which, which led to effects on ecosystem and so on and so forth. Um, and all of these are components of global change. Uh, and microplastic is basically just one of them. The important thing is that they don't just line up neatly and <laughs> basically act one after the other but they rather act concurrently on many places on earth. And I would say this is the rule rather than the exception. And so the question becomes, how well do we know about these concurrent effects of multiple factors or multiple global change drivers? And the answer is not very much. We don't know very much at all from experiments about what happens when more then one or two factors occur concurrently. This was done in a systematic mapping we did um, a few years back when we counted basically how many factors are used in experiments on global change and soil. And the answer was mostly one factor or two factors, then it drops off to three and barely visible four factors. And there's nothing um, more than that when it's quite reasonable to assume and actually often very well documented that there is very many more factors acting on a given soil at any point in time. This is also a trend that really hasn't changed over time as is shown on the right panel. Basically, this trend is pretty stable over time. So basically, drive this point home, 98 to 0.2% of all papers describing experiments with soil and these global change factors that are, you know, they're global change factors, so they are globally distributed and are believed to be active in most places on the planet, included only one or two factors rather than many factors. And there's very many reasons for this. Uh, for example, there's logistic constraints, people rely on capturing just the main players, there's research siloing where people go to different meetings and publish in different journals, and of course the most important reason is the combinatorial explosion problem, whereby when you include more factors in your experiment, the number of treatment combinations goes up very, very rapidly. With two factors and two levels, you have four. If you add another factor with two levels, you have eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512. And if you had 10 factors, you would have 1,024 treatment combinations. And nobody in ecology, at least not with soil, can do experiments on this. So one solution that we have thought of is um, rather than asking about these combinations of factors, we ask a much simpler question first we ask, what is the role of the number of factors? It is quite a different question, admittedly, and it seems almost like a silly question to ask because you're comparing apples and oranges, basically. But let's ask the question, what is the role of the number of factors separate from the identity and composition of factors? So how have we done that? We have made a gradient, an experimental gradient in the number of factors. And to separate the number of factors from the identity and composition of factors, we have borrowed a trick from biodiversity ecosystem function research. Namely, we use random draws to fill up replicates of the same number of factors. So for, for example, if we have two factors, we ask the question, what happens when we have two factors? Every replicate of that level two factors has two different randomly drawn factors from a pool of 10 factors. Like here maybe is microplastic and temperature, and here it's maybe drought and salinity, and maybe here it's microplastic and some pesticide. So every replicate is different. What they have in common is that it's two factors. Now we do this with um, 
10 different factors. Remember, this would require 1,024 treatment combinations if we did it the full factorial way, which is impossible. So here are our 10 factors. We have the control here, which is the uh, line that goes across this figure. We have drought, nitrogen deposition, temperature, microplastics, glyphosate, antibiotics, fungicide, copper, salinity, and insecticide. And you can see that about well, three or four of these factors have negative effects on one particular response variable here, water stable soil aggregates. About three or four have positive effects, as is expected and some of them have neutral effects. And here in the gray part of the curve comes this exercise that I just explained to you. We add more and more factors, but which factors we add is completely at random. And what you can see already with your just looking at it <laughs> without um, me showing you the statistics is there is a very clear directionality in the response. There is a clear decline in this particular uh, soil process, namely soil aggregation, with the number of factors that are active. That includes microplastic, but also many other factors as well as just explained. And that is a bit surprising, eh? because um, I mean, in, in, in essence, you would have expected chaos, you would have expected results to just jump around randomly, because you're literally, every replicate is different. And um, you would have expected it would all depend a lot on the composition and identity of the factors, but it did not. What actually came out was this relatively ordered response. There is a, a steady decline with the number of factors and the number of factors could actually explain a lot of the variability. Um, this is shown as statistics here, but I don't have time to explain them to you. But basically we uh, looked not just at aggregates, we also looked at water repellency, decomposition and respiration rate. And you basically always see this directional responses here. For water repellency was particularly interesting because there was only a detectable response after we had applied five factors or more. So well outside of the range of what people have typically captured in experiments where this goes to you know, three or four at the very, at the most. And so when we went to five factors and it didn't matter which five factors, there is this increase in water repellency suddenly that we didn't see coming anywhere and that it was not indicated by any of the single factor effects. We see effects also on fungal diversity and other aspects of diversity, including, including protists and bacteria. Uh, we basically observe an impoverished G, uh, microbiome, in this case of fungi, that I'll show you the data for. For example, ASV richness, you can think of it as something like species richness that also um, very nicely goes basically down with the number of factors. The composition has a directional change also going in a very clear direction. And basically the, the losses of species are not random at all. The basidium mycota were the species that were um, predominantly lost. Now we've since repeated this many, many times, many times actually now uh, with different soils, with different factors, so with slightly different setups. Um, one more of these uh, papers is published. The other ones are, you know, in the process of being prepared and analyzed. But we always see that same response. We see that it matters how many factors are actually active at any moment in time. And we've recently also done this in uh, with global observational data, where we had available to us a number of um, different values for contaminants and other global change drivers, and we used a thresholding approach to ask how many of these factors exceed a certain threshold, at which point we counted them as present. And basically this depiction in the top line here shows the higher the threshold we use, so the more severe that factor basically was at any of these points um, along the 260 different ecosystems that were included in the study, um, or um, we, we see that there is an, a basically an increasingly ten, an increasing tendency for this relationship to turn negative, which means this is the relationship between the number of stressors and the number of um, ecosystem functions or multi-services, as it's called here. Um, and also the models always included the, the number of factors as a variable that was retained in all cases. So it seems like this might also uh, basically play a role in just um, when you just don't do experiments, but just look at the data that is present. We are now um, 
and I'm getting to the end of my talk now, looking at this at uh, 10 factors in the field in the Berlin Global Change Experiment, where you can basically, this is 10 minutes walk from where I stand right now, where we look at 10 factors of global change and in these combinations of two, four, six, eight, and 10 factors, and we see the same responses now as well. I want to leave you with these conclusions. Microplastic is a novel factor of global change, is actually a suite of contaminants. It's just not one thing. It's already in itself complex, and it affects soil functions and the microbiome, especially in agroecosystems, which is important, which is there we, we grow our food, it might actually affect nutritional quality and definitely the microbiome composition. In reality, it's many factors that are active simultaneously, including microplastics uh, that affect our soils. And that means we have to basically deal with these co-occurring simultaneously acting factors. And those would be particularly common in agroecosystems where we grow our food and in urban areas where we live. And there really soil microbiomes and processes seem to be affected just by the sheer number of factors that are active at any uh, point. And the reason for that is higher level interactions that we themselves don't really understand yet. And just to make this quick link in a few seconds between soil microbiome and biodiversity effects, there are clearly these linkages like either indirectly um, when the soil microbiome changes influencing um, influence the crop quality, or also directly when um, microbiome colonizes the parts of the plant that we eat. And it's always important to keep in mind in, these, <laughs> in, in this kind of thinking that um, we know substantially less about these effects where it's relevant for the consumers after all the processing and transporting and storage has occurred compared to what's the case when we observe things typically on the field. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening, my lab um, basically for doing this work and the funding agencies for support. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matthias. This is this is really good. We can have time for, I think, a couple of questions. Um, if you would raise your hand, that would be the best way. And the little hand thing is down in the bottom under reactions so along the base of this Zoom. Mike, I can. I'm not hearing you if you're I, okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And I was trying to find the hand raised thing. So I just raised my hand, my own hand. Um, Matthias, thank you for that. A very nice presentation. Um, I, I wonder if you could um, maybe add a little more context to the impact on, on nutri nutritional quality of the crops. Um, and I'm wondering do we know, is there any evidence that these microplastics in the in the rhizosphere, in the root zone there, might be impacting uptake of any nutrients? Yeah, I'm not aware of any direct studies on this yet. I know people are working on this. Um, um, and I think, to my knowledge, there is not really any data yet for the part of the plant that would typically be consumed. But what uh, can be inferred, at least in part, from some of the responses that we do observe in the rhizosphere is that we very often see a vascular mycorrhizal fungal colonization greatly increased in the presence of microplastic. Don't know why, uh, but, you know, mycorrhizal fungi are nutritional symbiosis and they're often uh, related to um, nutrient contents or, of micronutrients and macronutrients in the plant tissue. And so by virtue of that, it could be expected that, that there are also shifts in nutritional quality. But of course, that is only the macro and micronutrients and doesn't speak at all to like, um, like secondary compounds that could also be very important. Thank you. Thank you. We have one from another committee member, uh, Nick Basta. Uh, yes, thank you. That was intriguing. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering when you have decomposition of microplastics and uh, do first of all, how long do, does it take before you actually have degradation down to something at the non, nanoparticle range? And does it stay nanoparticle, or you know, let, uh, does it absorb the soil, coagulate, and uh, what's the chance the plastic once it degrades staying nano? 
Yeah, I'm quite sure nobody knows. Uh, I'm quite sure nobody knows at what rate microplastic fragments further into nanoplastic. This is at best done from lab studies. Uh, I don't know exactly what the, the ranges are. The idea is that this stuff does not really readily decompose. It's just, uh, it fragments further. These things certainly do weather. I mean, they, they have changes in, in, in surface properties, um, like they get oxidized, um, they get more brittle, they get yellow, uh, some of the things that are quite well known and documented. Um, but to my knowledge, there is not really very good documentation for them really completely decomposing. I mean, mineralizing to CO2 and um, things like that, uh, because I think that it takes quite a long time. Of course, it depends on which plastic you're talking about, right? I mean, if you're talking about biodegradable plastic, so-called, <laughs> yeah. then the, the expectation is that they, uh, de that they really degrade and decompose in a reasonable time frame. Fact of the matter is that is also not known because really these things are assessed in composting facilities under highly regulated conditions. And it's quite unclear how that manifests in the environment, like in the soil in particular, where conditions could be quite different from the optimal conditions. Um, yeah, but um, you know, when you're talking about biodegradable compounds, of course, then the situation becomes totally different. In experiments where this has been done, you have a, a big decrease in plant growth. And the reason is not that these things are toxic, it's most likely, my interpretation, immobilization. You know, it's the same as, as you add straw to soil. If that stuff really decomposes, the microbes need to get the nutrients from somewhere to decompose this matter. And so then you get uh, most likely microbial immobilization in things when the stuff really is made to decompose and degrade like biodegradable plastic, because plastic is 80, 90 percent carbon. Right. OK, thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more question. And then remember, at the end of all three speakers, we're going to have time for questions. So I think Rebecca from our committee, Rebecca Nelson, uh, has her hand up. Rebecca? Uh, yeah, thank you, Diana. Uh, thanks, Matthias, for a really fantastic presentation. Um, uh, you know, and terrifying. I, mean, I was already terrified, but you've uh, made it <laughs> scarier with your 10-factor 10, 10 combinations. Um, I noticed that your 2020 publication had a co-author of Lehman, and I'm wondering if it's the uh, the one that I know who's involved in biochar related research and whether or not that's the case. Yeah, um, you know, what's the way forward? We've got all this plastic. You've brought up this plastic toxicity debt, which I think is a compelling and frightening concept. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if uh, you see pyrolysis turning that carbon that you mentioned into something that's actually a beneficial uh, thing. And, you know, is, is that an option? I've heard that plastic can be pyrolyzed pretty well. I'm curious if that's if that's a part of a solution to some of the sort of waste we might have in hand. Yeah, I mean, first of all, that is Johannes Lehmann, yes. <laughs> um, the second point is, um, <laughs> I think it's pretty much the only solution because, you know, I hate to be the harbinger of, of bad news, but I think that there's uh, simply no way we can easily fix this. I mean, uh, I think it's an illusion to think you could like, uh, you know, make up a cocktail of a bunch of microbes that you spray on the soil that will then decompose the stuff. This will simply not work because of the diversity of, of polymers that are involved, uh, let alone additives. I think I'm very pessimistic about this actually ever being able to be remediated. Uh, time could prove me wrong, hopefully, <laughs> but I, I'm not very optimistic. So I think literally this is the only chance we have is basically hope that this somehow will be good. And, and will be fine. It's of course carbon. You measure it right now when you do a CNN analysis of your soil. You do capture, of course, the microplastic carbon because it's organic carbon now. Uh, but it should be quite clear that this is a, a carbon pool that is quite distinct and different and much more undesirable compared to the soil organic carbon that mostly is derived from microbial necromass or at least half of it. And so, I mean, it is, 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 is organic carbon. I mean, you're quite right there. It could be stabilized inside of aggregates like other carbon as well. It could have a long turnover time because it's inherently rather persistent material. It's made that way. <laughs> it literally is made to last an eternity, even though it's only uh, used ever for a couple of minutes and seconds in some cases. This is the tragedy in the first place. But yeah, I think we have no other chance than to hope that it'll stay there and somehow be, uh, become inert and degrade over time. Thank you again, Matthias, for this uh, really interesting presentation. Scary, as Rebecca says, but interesting. <laughs> um, we'll now move on to our next speaker, Erlen Samaro, 
or some room. I'm sorry, I'm just blasting this, your name, Erlen. Uh, you can yeah. correct me. <laughs> he is an environmental chemist who has experience with environmental monitoring, contaminated sites, and landfill risk assessment, and soil and sediment remediation with a particular focus on sorbent amendment. He's a senior advisor to the Norwegian Geotechnical uh, Institute and is in the process of finishing his, his PhD with the Norwegian University of Life Science, studying the fate of contaminants and pyrolysis of waste and the subsequent use of waste biochars as sorbents for PFAS, which is going to be quite interesting. So Erlen, welcome. It's really great to have you. Well, thank you, and uh, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I guess I'm a bit of a lightweight here today compared to some of the two other presenters. Hopefully, though, this uh, uh, these results I'll be presenting will be interesting to the committee. So we're coming in for uh, from uh, more of an engineering perspective here, and um, as you mentioned in my PhD, I've been looking at pyrolysis and how pyrolysis can be used to uh, combat PFAS uh, through uh, pyrolyzing waste and thus destroying PFAS and then using the, the biochar produced in the pyrolysis process as a sorbent. So without much further ado, I'll just jump right into it. Uh, I'm not so sure how familiar you are with these PFAS compounds, um, they're per and polyfluorinated alcohol substances, and they are uh, referred to as forever chemicals. And they have been identified as a really big threat to our food and drinking water. And the reason for that is that these forever chemicals uh, belong to a class of compounds that we call PMT chemicals, which means they are persistent, they don't degrade in the environment, almost at all. And they are quite uh, soluble, uh, mobile due to, due to their water solubility. And um, they've been linked to different toxic effects, uh, uh, carcinogenic, uh, carcinogenic effects and, and some hormone disrupting effects among, amongst others. In the European REACH registry, there are more than 5,000 PFAS compounds registered. And the most famous one is perhaps this uh, PFAS we see on the, the right-hand side of my screen. Let me get the pointer, there we go. So uh, PFAS has a carbon chain with eight carbons that are fully saturated with fluorine and a sulfonic acid head group. Now, other PFAS uh, might have longer or shorter chains. They might be branched or linear. Uh, saturated with fluorine or, or partially uh, fluorinated, and we have uh, different head groups as well. So there are a lot of different uh, uh, variations to these uh, chemicals. They all have uh, fairly similar properties that are uh, beneficial for a whole bunch of different uses. Uh, most of them are surfactants, and PFOS has typically uh, been used in firefighting foam. Not anymore, it's been um, banned due to toxicity and other uh, environmental issues. Uh, but the problem is that production has shifted away from the few that we've been able to ban towards other alternatives. They have similar properties, uh, but uh, yeah, and then thus pose uh, likely a similar risk. Uh, other than firefighting foam, they're used in different surface coatings, uh, like textiles, textile coatings, waterproofing, uh, paper plates and cups, um, cooking utensils, and also in cosmetic, uh, cosmetics, building materials and uh, different industrial applications like electroplating. And uh, to link to what uh, Matthias was just talking about, uh, PFAS have also been associated with uh, plastic polymers because they are used in uh, polymer production. So since these compounds are used uh, pretty much everywhere, they accumulate in our waste streams. And this is an issue because the waste handling we use for a lot of these waste streams are not really developed to take care of these compounds. And then we get situations like we have with the sewage sludge 
I, uh, you might refer to as biosolids, maybe. But um, PFAS have uh, been found in a sewage sludge. And then we uh, maybe we digest the sludge or hygienize it, but we don't remove the PFAS. And then we spread it to soil. And then the PFAS will be taken up in plants or uh, leached to groundwater or surface water. And then uh, we get exposed. And we have a bit of a, a vicious cycle here. So therefore, some thermal treatments have been suggested as an alternative option because thermal treatments will actually then destroy these compounds rather than just cycle them back into the environment. And speaking of thermal treatments, pyrolysis is a very promising option uh, compared to, for example, waste incineration because um, pyrolysis produces biochar. So pyrolysis is heating in the absence of oxygen. And uh, this means that we have a charring process. So if you have a lot of organic carbon, it's turned into um, aromatic type carbon, like elemental aromatic type carbon. And in this process, you're storing maybe 50% of the carbon in the, the feedstock. It's also been shown that in some lab studies that uh, you can decompose some uh, organic contaminants that aren't so persistent. Uh, and some lab studies also show that uh, pyrolysis might be suitable to decompose PFAS. So if we introduce pyrolysis in our cycle here, could we then maybe uh, remove PFAS before we then rather use the biochar for soil, soil application uh, than the sludge directly? So that's the one part, but then the biochar can also be used. It has a lot of uh, nice properties. It actually works as a sorbent in a similar way as activated carbon does, because uh, those matrices are quite similar. So when you use uh, a sorbent, uh, it binds a contaminant very strongly and doesn't release it again. So when you apply it in soil remediation, uh, like shown in this, in this uh, schematic, you can see that the idea is that you introduce the biochar and then the contaminants uh, that have a, a high affinity for the biochar surface bind to the biochar rather than being taken up by the plant or released uh, to groundwater. But PFAS does not only accumulate in our wastes. There are a lot of soils that are contaminated by PFAS, as I know you have spoken about in, this, uh, in these meetings as well. And uh, this figure is quite interesting. It shows a map of uh, known contaminated and possible contaminated sites across Europe. It was compiled by the Forever Pollution Project and published in the Le Monde newspaper a couple of months ago. And uh, they have identified more than 17,000 sites in Europe. And there are some studies that show when you have heavily contaminated sites, like firefighting training sites uh, that are not remediated, they will continue to release PFAS compounds to uh, nearby water sources uh, for centuries to come, likely causing these water sources to uh, uh, get hazardous levels of, of PFAS then for centuries, if nothing is done. But uh, stabilizing these soils with biochar might be an alternative, uh, a way to stop them for, from uh, leaching and being taken up in plants. So uh, the first part, uh, pyrolysis as a sludge treatment or as a waste treatment. So uh, we wanted to see what happened to PFAS in a full-scale relevant system. Because I, I mentioned there were some laboratory studies, but there are very, very few uh, full-scale studies that shows an industrially relevant context. So uh, we have this uh, pyrolysis, uh, biogreen pyrolysis unit made by a French company called ETIA. And uh, we um, looked at PFAS going in through the sludge feedstock, PFAS in the biochar coming out, and also PFAS in the emitted flue gas. Now, uh, the, uh, the <clears throat> sludge is first heated in the pyrolysis reactor here, and then the um, pyrolysis gas is released, uh, condensed to take the oils out, and then the gas is combusted in a combustion chamber. 
So there were no standard method available for PFAS and biochars, and this is a bit of an issue. We tried the, the methods that commercial labs uh, use, and uh, if you do that, you run the risk of getting, um, uh, getting false negatives because the extraction is not strong enough. So uh, we tested some methods, and we found out that you need uh, a fairly strong uh, organic po polar organic solvent We lost him. Okay. I hope he comes back. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. I think we'll take a minute here and and uh, give him a break to get back on while we're just in the start of this story about what works. I think what we'll do is is give him one more minute to see if he hooks on and then we'll um, move to Marcel and then come back to pick up the story if that's if that's the best way we can do it. I, I don't know what happened. Oh, wonderful. Erlen? Yes, I uh, don't, I'm terribly sorry about that. Something happened to my connection. Well, we're glad you're back. We were just into this story that you're starting to tell us, and we want to hear the rest. Yeah, I was so sorry about that. The timing was not good. So I'll, I'll try to continue quickly. Okay, sorry that'd be that. great. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Can you see my screen? I can. Yes, thanks. Perfect. Thanks. All right. So as I was saying, we were looking at uh, we four different sludges. And uh, two of them were digested and aerobically digested. One was digested and limed. And the last one was a raw sludge. So uh, these all contain fairly high concentrations of PFAS between 56 and 441 nanograms per gram, the same as micrograms per kilo, which is a lot, um, especially if you consider this new proposed risk level for soils, which is between 0.1 and 10 nanograms per gram. So as you can imagine, this is not a good idea to spread this directly on agricultural agricult uh, soils. So what happens when we pyrolyze? All right, there's something. 
Okay, something is happening with this. Ah, there we go. All right, uh, so uh, when we pyrolyzed, we saw a one to three orders of magnitude concentration drop. And there were 60 to 100% fewer congeners. So we go from several hundred to only a few nanograms per gram. And increasing the time of pyrolysis temperature uh, reduces these concentrations even further. There were some matrix effects though. So uh, some sludges were harder to remove the PFAS from. And this was because they contained more of these long chain PFAS, which tend to remain more in the solid matrix. It's, uh, the total mass of these target analytes uh, in the biochar were uh, 2% of the total going into the system. So uh, this is a, a pretty good deal that we're, we're getting rid of 98% uh, of, of uh, what was in the solid phase. Um, there is a small fraction that survives both uh, the pyrolysis chamber and the combustion chamber, though. So we measured uh, a release of 0 0.01 to 3 milliga milligrams PFAS per ton of biochar produced. These emissions were dominated by short chain PFAS, uh, probably because they're more volatile, uh, and also because you have uh, partial thermal degradation of longer chains. Uh, the emitted uh, amount of PFAS accounts for up to 2.8% uh, of uh, the total target analyte mass. There are still some uncertainties, though, related to uh, the non-quantified degradation products in the flue gas. And just before we move on to the sorbent parts, I uh, just want to show some data for some other compounds that might be of interest. Uh, we found uh, quite a lot of OPFRs, organophosphorus flame retardants, uh, PCBs, and dioxins in the sludges. So uh, the graph on the right side shows dioxins, and we can see that concentrations in the raw material range between 2,000 and a couple of hundred um, picograms TEQ per gram. But uh, pyrolyzing at 500 degrees or above removed more than 99% of all of these uh, organic contaminants. PHs uh, were a bit more unpredictable. There were no clear co uh, correlations between uh, pH content in the biochar and uh, temperature or feedstock. So we suspect uh, the pH content is more related to the, the technology used. And there are some other studies that show that 500 degrees is also sufficient to destroy microplastics and uh, pharmaceuticals and endocrine disruptic disruptors, uh, antibiotics, and, and others. So this looks quite promising, to be honest. Moving on to the second part. So can we use the, the biochar that we produce from the sludges for PFAS remediation? So we took two of our sludges and uh, compared them to a clean wood biochar. They were all produced at 700 degrees. We know we need quite high temperatures to produce good sorbents. Then we did some sorption tests with uh, different PFAS compounds. And when we do this, we typically do a batch shaking test uh, where we have uh, water, the sorbent, and we add a known concentration of PFAS. And we shake for a long time to assume equilibrium, uh, filter, and look at what remains in the water phase. And if you do this across a fairly wide concentration span, you can get these sorption isotherms. So uh, this graph shows Freundlich sorption isotherms for PFOA and the wood chips by a char on the top and then the two sludges at the bottom. Now, when you do this um, log log plot of the uh, Freundlich isotherm, the slope gives you the K at uh, Freundlich partitioning coefficient, which describes how strongly the biochar binds uh, the, the sorbate in question. So the interesting thing here is that uh, our two sludges, the KF values actually higher than the wood biochar. This was very surprising to us uh, as it's kind of common knowledge that uh, wood biochars are the best feedstocks for sorbents. Uh, these KF values for the sludges actually rival uh, those of activated carbons commu uh, produced commercially. So that was uh, very surprising. And uh, the reason why, uh, why we believe these sludges are such good sorbents for PFAS is related to the porosity. 
Now, if we look at some um, internal surface area and pore volume data here, you can see the wood chips uh, biochar at the top, and it had between four and eight times higher internal surface area than the sludge chars. So based on this, we would accept the, the wood chips biochar to be a lot better. But if we look at how this porosity is distributed, uh, so uh, what size of pores uh, do you find this surf internal surface area inside of? We can see that the wood chip spyachar has most of its internal surface area uh, in this very micropore range between 0.3 maybe and, and one or two nanometers. Whereas the sludge chars have most of their pore volume and, and internal surface area in the range between maybe two and 30 nanometers. And if we think about the size of these PFAS molecules, they are quite big. So uh, they have effective diameters of one to two nanometers or larger. So they pretty much don't fit inside these uh, small wood biochar pores. So uh, the sludge chars uh, are mesopores, which fits these type of compounds well. Uh, we also wanted to know if this works in soil because uh, lab sorption test is one thing, but how does this actually play out in soil? So we did these upflow uh, column percolation tests where we pack a cylinder with soil and pump water through. Then we had different uh, sludge chars, three of them, and compared them to three wood chars. Uh, one of them was activated. And then here we have the data. So uh, the soil we used was uh, um, soil from a firefighting training site where there was a lot of PFOS. So if we look at the panel uh, at the bottom, the PFOS, that's the most important one. We can see that our sludge chars, the orange, the yellow, and the, the light greenish um, actually reduce the leaching of PFOS from this soil relative to the control by more than 90%. And this is just with 1% of the sludge char. Uh, the activated wood biochar was the best one, but these sludges uh, perform very close to that. Um, if we look at the more short chain PFAS, however, it is they are a bit more difficult to contain. So here we have some unanswered answered questions about how to stop they're leaching. So we might need higher doses or maybe some, some um, uh, modifications to the sorbents. So to conclude, um, we found that pyrolysis could be a suitable treatment for contaminated sewage sludge if operated at sufficiently high temperatures. So preferably 600 degrees or above because then you uh, decompose and the volatilize organic contaminants. And it also has a beneficial effect on the heavy metals in the sludge. Uh, emissions though might warrant flue gas cleaning uh, if this is scaled up. This high pyrolysis temperature is also beneficial to produce sorbents that can be used for PFAS. And these sludge sorbents could actually be really good sorbents for PFAS in soil. Okay, with that, I just want to acknowledge some funding and other contributors and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Erlen. That was really eye-opening, uh, both in the amount of PFAS there are and where they're covered and, uh, and also the re results that you're getting here. We'll do like we did before. We're gonna open um, to the committee for questions. And so, I hope the committee has found your little yellow hand or whatever it is that we put up and we'll start off with some questions, Nick. Uh, that was fantastic presentation, thank you. The, um, what I'm wondering about is the, the, the microporosity and the absorption. Do you think that this absorption by the, uh, into the, uh, by, in the biosolids chart, is irreversible? It's small enough that it actually could be considered irreversible absorption? Yes, so um, a, K, a KF value of about five, it's a log value. So it means that you have uh, 10 to the power of five uh, over one, like the ratio between right. the sorbent in the water and the solid phase. Uh, and uh, this is at equilibrium. So uh, these type of KF values you also have from 
for um, hydrophobic contaminants like PHs and dioxins when they bind to to uh, pyrogenic carbons. And this this is uh, I'd say near to irreversible sorption. It's the hydrophobic interactions between the sorbate and the, the biochar is uh, it's very strong. Okay, I because you know if we have a compound that C8 right and it lasts 50 years right, uh, we want to make sure that it's going to be bound irreversibly. Okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, these biochars are are quite stable in soil. Uh, there are. It's a bit contested how stable they are, but they will last at least 100 years or maybe 1,000 or 2,000 years without okay. breaking down. So these are uh, condensed aromatic carbon structures. So uh, right. they uh, type of uh, carbon that's uh, is inert in the environment, or not completely, but close to. So yeah, and with the, the strong interaction then between the sorbate and the biochar, we expect it to be uh, ir uh, irreversibly bound. you know, trapped mm -hmm. in the micropores and not coming out. Okay. Exactly. So it's okay. it's uh, trapped in the micropore system and also very strongly bound. Okay. Okay. Thank you. More questions. Rebecca, this is another committee member. Thanks so much, Erlen. Um, your map of PFAS contamination of European soils is quite, uh, again, quite uh, worrisome, and I fear that my country would look similar if mapped. And um, I'm wondering, and your your findings are so striking, and I'm wondering if you see policy traction in terms of having uh, interest by the wastewater establishment and the and the general policy establishment for implementing biochar at scale. So just to say that um, we've been sort of trying to motivate similar change here in our own community and in the, in the United States. And it's actually really difficult to, to clear the substantial um, infrastructural, you know, the cost of, of setting up the pyrolysis capability in a wastewater treatment plant. I mean, these are, you know, ex enormously expensive facilities and messing with them at all is difficult and putting that capability in is difficult and there's all sorts of concerns. And I'm just wondering how that, how that's going in Europe or uh, generally. Yeah, so there are a lot of things going on right now related to pyrolysis and, and sludge treatments in Europe. Uh, in 2019, there was a report by, um, a uh, technical group uh, uh, by the European Commission who su suggested uh, biochars from sludge could not be used in agriculture yet or in soils in general because there are too many uncertainties about the fate of organic contaminants in the process. Now this data is uh, emerging and uh, I'm, I suspect that things might change, but still, uh, for now, uh, you're not supposed to use uh, uh, sludge chars in agriculture, although there are some differences. Some countries do allow it. So that's one thing. Uh, when it comes to remediation, there are a lot of things happening. Um, so my company and uh, working together with uh, the University of Copenhagen has just received a, a huge grant to uh, actually study remediation alternatives uh, for Europe or contaminated sites in Europe. And here the goal is to um, establish a risk assessment tool, but also a tool to suggest the best ways of remediating uh, sites. And for PFAS, we have uh, sorbents and biochar on the radar, the radar as one of the cases uh, we're going to, to set up. So uh, things are happening. There are a lot of other um, other uh, research institutions working on this. Uh, so that's the one side, but then there's also a large um, development on the industrial sites. There are a lot of companies who are um, trying to uh, go for pyrolysis, for waste handling and setting up uh, technological solutions. So they see a market that's uh, developing really fast. And also uh, with the possibilities for these uh, integrated solutions, as you said, it's it's costly, you know, to invest in these kind of pyrolysis plants. But if you can uh, integrate it into um, a bigger waste handling system, like one of our industrial partners in, uh, in a research project we're uh, doing right now, they have um, uh, biogas plants and they want to uh, 
pyrolyze the digestate from the biogas plant and they want to circle the excess heat back to the biogas plant and then they want to use the biochar they produce uh, to clean uh, wastewater from the facility. So yeah, there's um, this might be the way forward, you know, through these uh, integrated solutions. And if they can produce uh, a material that they can sell as a sorbent, yeah, that makes uh, even more sense. Okay, thank you. I think we'll move on now to uh, the next speaker. Thank you, Erlen. Really enjoyed that talk. Um, Marcel van der Heiden. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce him. He's a professor of agroecology and plant microbe, sorry, plant microbiome interactions at the University of Zurich. And he also heads up the plant soil interactions group at the Swiss Federal Research Institute, Agroscope. He is an extraordinary professor in micro, Michael Reisel Ecology at Utrecht University and president of the International Mycorrhiza Society. His research group performs a mix of basic and applied research, specifically investigating how soil microbial diversity and root microbiome complexity influence plant productivity, soil health, and ecosystem functioning. Marcel, welcome. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Diana. Uh, I very much enjoyed the previous talks from Ireland and Matthias. So um, I will talk about pesticides mainly and about soil microbiomes and soil health. Um, I think many of you are familiar with this. Uh, soils are alive. They are highly diverse. So in one gram of soil, you find billions of bacteria and sometimes up to 10, 20,000 different taxa of bacteria and, and hundreds of meters of hyphae. So here you see a, a picture of some creatures which you find uh, below ground in the soil and many people are not aware of it. So soil animals, fungi, bacteria, lots of, of, of microbes are there and they're really beautiful and have very important roles. And so we uh, focus mainly on agricultural uh, systems and uh, especially on soil microbiomes and also plant microbiomes. So you see here a picture, a nice soil profile. You see grasses, you see trees, and you have to imagine that all these substrates are colonized by microbes, which we don't see. So we need a lot of um, tools for that, microscopy, molecular tools to visualize them. And then we see some things, for instance, important groups are nitrogen fixing bacteria, which bring in nitrogen in the soil in a natural way. Earthworms, you're probably very familiar with, or also arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which help plants to acquire nutrients and, uh, and grow better, be resistant to stress. What people do not know really often is that there's a huge amount of biomass below ground. So you see here 18 different cows, if you count very fast. So that's 15 tons of biomass, which is hidden below ground under our feet in the soil in a, in a fertile agricultural system. So there's a, a huge amount of, of, of life. And, and this, all these organisms together, they determine the soil health. So in a recent paper together with, with Sam Banarier, who's also in the audience, uh, we try to kind of summarize what's the inf influence of soil biota, especially soil microbes. So the soil microbiome on plant health, on soil health. And basically what we discovered, there's really a lot to discover. And I think this also has already been directly or indirectly touched upon by, by Alan and uh, Matthias before. So we know, of course, that soil microbes have a big influence on plant health. But now more and more we start to realize that the health of us humans or the health of cows is also related to what's going on in the soil environment. So I think that's, it's a very important area. And also I think it's very important to go more to the systems approach. Don't focus anymore on very specific problems, but I think also Matthias talked about that, these different interactions between factors to look at the whole system. And one thing we, for instance, observed is that if you, uh, you see often that if soil microbial diversity goes up, that a system is performing better. That's true for plants, that's true for, for soils, but it's also true for humans. And that's especially important if soil microbial diversity is very low, if it's a highly stressed system, if soil microbial diversity is, is much higher, it's maybe not so important, but especially in very stressed systems where there's re reduced microbial diversity, then health of plants, soils, but also and of us uh, humans is going down. And so we wanted to know, yeah, what are the factors that determine one health? And, and there are a number of factors, of course, soil conditions, climate, but also one factor are the pesticides. And there is more and more evidence that pesticides have an impact on soil health 
on plant health and even on human health. Also, there's really a lot still to investigate. There are many indirect pieces of evidence, and that's often the problem. If it's, is it the pesticides or is it something related to pesticides? So we start to investigate this a couple of years ago. And this was actually, I came into it by accident. And I'm, I'm, I'm based in Switzerland. And in Switzerland, people can vote about many different issues. So there were two referenda where people could vote whether the government still should pay uh, funding to farmers that use pesticides. So there was a lot of interest in pesticides uh, impact on agriculture, on solar. And so we got basically funding to investigate that. And that's why I suddenly started to work on pesticides. And I think it's very interesting and very relevant. Of course, here you see a map of the world with the the, the intensity of the amount of pesticides which are being sprayed. So in Switzerland, this is ranked number 37, about five kilograms of pesticides per hectare in year. In the United States, for instance, two and a half kilogram per hectare in year. And uh, some other countries is a bit higher. What is uh, as also very important to mention, it depends very much on the crop. So in Swiss vineyards, we find up to 25 to 30 kilograms of pesticides are applied every year. So it depends very much on the crop. In grasslands, nothing is applied. So basically, then we started to investigate. We had uh, large farming networks, so on, on fields of farmers. So it's, it's real world research. So we had 60 arable fields and we had 30, 40 vegetable fields and number of grasslands. We had soil samples from them. We measured a lot of things. And to, together with my uh, colleagues, with uh, Judith Rido, who did a PhD with Florian Walder and Thomas Pucheli, who was a chemist, we analyzed then the occurrence of these pesticides in the soil. So we had herbicides, we had fungicides and insecticides. And we had also different types of soils. So we had organically managed soils. So that means no synthetic pesticides are applied. No mineral fertilizers are applied. We had normal conventional tilled soils and also soil with no tillage. So conservation agriculture and the same for these vegetable fields. So here you see the map of Switzerland with the location of these different uh, sites. So here you see some of the results we, we observed. So here you see on the y-axis the number of pesticides for arable farming, for conventional, of course, logically, in conventional farming, they apply pesticides. So we also found most pesticides. So we found on average about 17 different pesticides in, so in a few grams of soil. But what we also found, and this was a bit a big surprise to me personally, not to the chemist, Thomas Pucheli, who knows that chemicals are everywhere, but also in organically managed uh, sites, we found on average uh, seven pesticides. And actually on one site, we even found 16 different pesticides. So that means there's, uh, these are sites which have not been treated with synthetic pesticides, which we still quite, found quite a bit. And each dot here, what you see is a different farm, is a different location. So you see also there's a high variation. And for instance, the biological site has a high, with the highest value has a higher value as some of the conventionally managed sites. Same results for vegetable farming, which actually had higher concentrations because it's much more intensive in Switzerland. Then what we also observed, we, we plot then the duration of organic farming. So the duration since when no uh, pesticides have been applied. So you again, you see here the number of pesticides on the y-axis. So each dot is again one particular location. And then you see, not surprisingly, the highest concentration uh, uh, amounts and number of pesticides in conventionally managed fields. And then it goes down. So after 20 years, we still find pesticides, but the number reduced. But for instance, after 20 years of organic farming here, this one farm had 16 different pesticides. So it's really there and they do not disappear. So some of them are really very persistent or some pesticides also came from neighboring uh, locations. So from fields, conventional fields beside which uh, have been spraying. So that is the occurrence of pesticides. And also maybe important to mention, we only measured 14% of the pesticides which have been applied uh, in, in Switzerland. So technically we could do that. We, now we can measure much more. So, and then we, we are going to correlate this. We, we assess the microbiome in the soil. So we look to the bacterial communities. So 16S, we look to fungal communities, ITS. And then we look to how individual compounds of pesticides, how they correlate to these different microbes. And there's something quite surprising in a way turned up. So if it's blue, the color, it means there's a positive correlation. So we saw that actually many different bacteria correlated positively to the occurrence of particular pesticides. That means if pesticides is there, they are more abundant. Hmm. Then we looked at the sequences. We wanted to know the identity of these bacteria. And then it was not so surprising. Many of these taxa, which we observed, which responded positively actually are known to degrade pesticides. So they can help actually to, to get rid of them. The same for fungi, also many taxa responded positively, but of course also many fungi were not affected. And we actually observed in, in, in 
the paper by, by Florian Walder, we observed that pesticides have a really big impact on the soil microbiome. So there's something going on. But there are also a few groups in red, that means they respond negatively. And the question is, of course, what are these particular groups doing? So we then focused on arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. This is a group of well-known beneficial soil fungi. They associate with about 60% of all land plants. They associate with crops, so with potato, with wheat, with maize, soybean. So they're very abundant in agricultural sites. And they are thought, and we have also shown that, Matthias really also has worked on them and showed that, that they have a big impact on plant nutrition. And there's something turned up, which kind of shocked me really. So we had here the number of pesticides on the x-axis, and then here the abundance of these mycorrhizal fungi in plant roots. So and what we observed, actually, there was a very strong negative correlation. So each dot is, again, one agricultural field. So we observed that the higher the number of pesticides in the soil, the lower the colonization by these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So in, in, in green are the organically managed sites, and in blue are the conventionally managed sites. And this is an R squared of, of 30%, which is really very high for, for, for outside research and agricultural fields. So and then we did some statistics, and this kind of confirmed it. We observed that pH, soil pH, acidity of the soil has a big impact on the abundance of mycorrhizal fungi. This has been known already for 30 or 40 years, but equally important was the number of, of, uh, of, of residues of pesticides. So pesticides have a very big impact on the abundance of these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And so this is really unknown. And now we're further investigating this. And here I present you a, a different uh, study, which is, it goes in the same direction. It was a, a surprise finding, I have to say. So we had a big biodiversity pro project uh, where we had, here's the map of Europe. So we had uh, people uh, participating from Sweden, from Germany, uh, Matthias Rielich and his team, then from France and Spain and our, us in Switzerland. And all the people, they sent soil samples of different agricultural fields. And also from grassland, they sent it to us in Switzerland. We put it in small little pots. We filled these pots, put the plants in there. And there we had a hyphal compartment. And in that hyphal compartment, we added 33P. And this hyphal compartment, so plant roots could not enter in the hyphal compartment, but mycorrhizal fungi could enter. And basically what we then could measure is what, what factors determine the uptake of phosphorus from this hyphal compartment. This work was, was done by PhD student uh, Anna Edlinger. And uh, so what we observed first is that, and this was a bit surprising to us, that the abundance or the diversity of these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, so the number of taxa and so on, that this was actually declining with the number of fungicide applications. So farmers that had applied many times fungicide, they had a lower diversity, so fewer arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi uh, compared to farmers who didn't apply it. And then we also looked then at the uptake of this 33P of this phosphorus from this hyphal compartment where only the fungal hyphal could go. And there we observed the same result. Actually, when fungicides were applied, uh, the recovery of this uh, phosphorus from the soil and the delivery to the plant, so they, they live in the symbiosis, was reduced. Again, then we also did complex statistics. So in grassland soils, we observed that pH was the most important factor that positively uh, explained uh, phosphorus uptake. But of course, also most interesting is cropland because it's productivity, it's food produced for us. And there it turned out that pH was a little bit important, but not significant. But what was important is fungicide application. So if more fungicides were applied, which you see here on the right, then the uptake of phosphorus was reduced. And at the same time, we observed that if you have more mycorrhizal fungi in the soil, that um, uh, that uh, has a positive relationship, but because the fungicide application had a negative uh, uh, impact on the richness of these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, this was an additional factor. So we had two pieces of evidence very independent from each other, and this was actually a by accident result because the hypothesis of the study was completely different, but certainly the fungicides turned up. So now I would like to, to move on to a bit more general systems. So uh, we, we, we are currently uh, comparing different farming systems. So we have conventional farming in blue, conventional no, no tillage, conservation agriculture, and we have organic systems. And here again, we have these systems uh, in organic, there are no pesticides applied. Here you see the same network, which I also presented before with where we assessed the different uh, pesticides. And so we wanted to know, yeah, what are, what are the factors? How are they affecting a number of ecosystem services? So we go a bit more holistic. 
And so one thing we observe, for instance, that uh, the supporting services, so that's biodiversity in the soil, biodiversity above ground, but also soil fertility, that this was highest in organically managed fields. And so the question now, which we have to investigate, is this linked to pesticides or is this linked to the changes in, in mineral fertilization or crop rotation? But also, for example, we looked at regulating services. So soil protection, for instance, in Switzerland is very hilly. So we have quite a bit of erosion. And, and this is a, a problem. And so we observed that in, under no tillage or an organic, uh, organic management systems, we have uh, less soil erosion. We have better soil structure, we have more soil carbon in the soil. So these are factors which indirectly are linked to management and indirectly also are linked to pesticide use. And so one thing we also would like to talk here about soil health. So we assessed in these farming networks where we also assessed the pesticides, we assessed the health. And there we observed basically that soil health was highest in organically managed uh, systems. And so how did we assess soil health? We measured soil organic carbon, we measured microbial abundance, we me measured microbial diversity, soil structure. And this was generally higher in organically managed fields where no synthetic pesticides are applied. So now the next step is to make these links and test how that, uh, how, how that is related to pesticide use. One also one thing which I liked a lot is again, it's about soil health. So if soil health is good, usually aggregate size is, is, is higher, is bigger than more more aggregates, there are bigger aggregates. And also usually if you have a good soil with good health, there's more microbial biomass. And what we then observed when we, we take the soils from many of these fields, we observed that actually soil health is positively linked to nutrient use efficiency. That means if the soil is very healthy, probably also less, fer less fertilizers and less pesticides are used, that then also the nutrients which are applied by the farmers are used more efficiently. So they're not lost. So that's also indirect. So the farmer has to apply more uh, best, more fertilizers to correct for changes in soil health. So I think this, these are important things to consider to, to develop more sustainable farming systems. Okay, I would like to just end up with the final slide. So we have recently been active in a, a, a soil monitoring project in the European Union. This is together with the Joint Research Center of the European Union with Alberto Orgiasi and uh, Arwen Jones and Panos Panagos and many other people. So this is a very large monitoring, monitoring system from the European Union. We have been now measuring microbial diversity, so diversity of bacteria, fungi, protists, soil arthropods. Uh, and also we recently uh, got data on the occurrence of pesticides in many of these soil soils. And now we're actually linking uh, pesticide occurrence to the occurrence of, of microbes to, to see at a very large European scale how the occurrence of pesticides in the soil is, is, is driving the microbiome or maybe is also not driving the microbiome. That's what we're basically testing. Okay, I would like to uh, end with some conclusions. So I hope that I have shown to you that soil microbiomes have a big impact on soil, plant and environmental health. Also the impact of, on human health is there, but I think there's more to be investigated. So we have observed in our studies that synthetic pesticides are very widespread in agricultural and natural ecosystems. And they're basically everywhere. Uh, we also found even in samples from, from Antarctica, we found some, some pesticides, like Matthias mentioned this also for the microplastics. Uh, what we also observed is soil microbes respond very variable to pesticides, some basically like them, but also some very beneficial ones, such as Arbus clomycorrhiza fungi, they are clearly suppressed. So they reduce ecosystem services. And this is something to investigate in more detail for the future. And also I think a last point, I think a more general point, the importance of soil microbiome diversity for agroecosystems is still poorly understood. And I think there's a lot to win also, and this should be considered by policymakers, by farmers and the society in general. And then I would like to thank a lot of people for collaboration and would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marcel. Uh, let's take a, a couple of questions for Marcel and then we'll ask all the panelists to come back, all the speakers to come back and the committee can ask them questions. Uh, do we have any uh, questions to start off with? I guess I would say right away. Hi, let's go with uh, you. Sorry. No, oh, is it, oh, there you is go. It, I'm sorry. Me? Yeah, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Marcel. That was really interesting. Um, I was wondering, it makes sense, the effect of fungicide on our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, but in terms of pesticides, you seem to lump them into one group. And 
Have you looked into, you know, the effect of herbicides, insecticides and fungicides? And what are you seeing in terms of the soil microbiome? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, we officially did this. So uh, what I showed, basically, I showed the variable which explained most variants. And this is itself already an interesting observation. So we observed indeed that fungicides had a negative correlation with the abundance of mycorrhizal fungi, but it looks like but that's, that needs to be investigated that there are uh, effects when you have different compounds. So some herbicides also had negative correlation with uh, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. So it's, 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 the, it's the, the, the basically the biodiversity effect of the pesticides that explained most variants. So we also could, I mean, what we also observed that usually if farmers apply a lot of herbicides, they also apply a lot of uh, fungicides and insecticides. So it's all correlated. So uh, it, the use of these different compounds, but the, the total numbers was the, the variable that explained most. And I think that often uh, the industry also, they have to look at the effects of individual compounds, but I think it's it's worthwhile and important to look at also, and Matthias again also sh showed that uh, earlier, to look at the interaction between different compounds. Thanks. Any other questions for Marcel? Wait a second to get everybody's attention on this. Okay, why don't we bring, um, we're right on time, so let's bring all our speakers and then we can decide to ask questions that range from multiple climate change factors and microplastics to pyrolysis to uh, pesticide use and anything else that the committee wants to ask about soil health and human health. So. And I should say you, you speakers can ask each other questions too, if you want to. <laughs> this is kind of a discussion, I like these. Eva, do you have another question? Yeah, I do. Okay, for, good. for maybe all of the three speakers. And um, I mean, you've all described this potential problems with PFAS and pesticides and microplastic contamination in soil. And for farmers that produce our soil, I mean, eventually in this report, we have to come up with some recommendation. And obviously the first one is to stop using all three of them, but that's probably not realistic. And even, I mean, they're already there. So if you could think about some recommendation in terms of um, changes in management that we can use, you know, promoting soil organic matter, what, what would that be? Go ahead, Matthias. Oh. Yeah, I mean, um, th there is often the tendency to uh, put sort of the onus on the individual end user like the farmer but um i think that is a bit unfair because the farmer can only really use the products that are available to them at any point in time it's the same question i get also for microplastic what, what should we do i mean should we yeah not use plastic straws yeah of course you should not use plastic straws and all that it's all good but i think who is really um should be held responsible, for lack of a better term, is like the producers, the industry should, for example, for the case of plastic, um, they should produce um, plastic materials that are more readily degradable, for example, or that, um, you know, there is already technology available for, for things to sort of start degrading themselves because they have enzymes built in and whatnot. I'm not familiar with all this, but I think that the I think that there is a responsibility, um, not just for the end user, like the farmer or the individual in with their household, but also for industry to provide products that are maybe more thought um, in with a, a, a cyclical uh, process from the very beginning. The problem with plastic is it's was very linear <laughs> thinking, right? I mean, it's used for a couple of seconds or minutes and then it, it's lasting uh, basically hundreds of years. That's the problem. Marcel, you had your hand up. Yeah, I, I fully agree. I think we also should look at us, at consumers. Uh, I mean, what often is said against organic management, so management without synthetic pesticide application and with less mineral fertilizer and no mineral fertilizer application, that the yield is 20, 25, sometimes 30% less. Uh, 
but if we eat, for instance, a bit less meat, uh, about 50% of, of the arable crops in the world are produced to feed basically um, cows and, and, and pigs and, and animals, etc. So there is actually not a problem to produce a bit more sustainable with less uh, pesticides and less fertilizers. But th the issue, of course, is are we consumers willing to pay a bit more for this food? And I think in Europe or the United States, I think the average income which is used for food is 8%. So, I mean, I would say, does it matter if we spend 8% or 9% or 10% for food? I mean, these, I think these are discussions and people can indeed, as, as Matthias said, they can point to the farmers, but they do basically what, what is the demand. People want to have cheap food. Many people want to eat a lot of meat. And I don't say you don't shouldn't eat meat. I also eat meat. I like a barbecue and so on, but you can eat a bit less. And then also there is more land available to produce a food a bit more sustainable. So that I think these are issues. Okay, thank you, Erlen. Yeah, uh, I agree with what uh, Marcel and Matthias are saying. I think this, um, this question that you pose is extremely complex and it has all these layers, right? Um, so, of course, we have to do something about the big structures, especially when it comes to chemicals uh, that I'm um, working with. Uh, we have to identify where we actually need to use these chemicals, like the PFAS. They're used in a lot of diff uh, different applications. Uh, a lot of them are because they're convenient and others is because they're very necessary. So we need, need to identify and phase out all those applications that aren't strictly necessary to reduce emissions, of course. Same goes for, for plastics and also for uh, plasticizer or chemicals. So uh, the, the chemicals we use add to plastics are used in plastics uh, production. So some of the first plastics were produced without uh, phthalates, for example, and they, were, they, they weren't uh, persistent enough. So we made them that way, so they would be better for us. But when it comes to what we can actually do, or the farmer, uh, I'd say in the context of what I've been studying, um, we could try to implement uh, the use of biochar to a larger extent, as it has uh, several benefits, not only the sorption part, but it, it can increase crop yields. Uh, at least we're storing some carbon, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, is good, I guess, uh, but if we, find a way to use the right types of, of biochars. We could also trap a lot of these contaminants that we find in the soils because of well, microplastics pollution and PFAS pollution and the likes. So I think that's a uh, that's thing that could uh, be implemented. Uh, also, we need to stop using biosolids or sewage sludges directly on agricultural soils. It's a horrible idea. It, it's not only the PFAS, it's, it's a uh, huge loads of microplastics and flame retardants and uh, dioxins and PCBs, all these legacy contaminants, uh, heavy metals, the whole range. So yeah, very difficult question. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I didn't mean to put it all on the farmers here. I'm just curious because you know the, the, they're already there. So what can we do to minimize the negative impact of them being there in the soil? So thank you for that. Uh, Kate, Kate Scal. Mm -hmm. I can't hear you. Just talking to the air here. Hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had a question about the biochar is the, um, and, and maybe you got into this a little bit, but what are the application rates that are needed to be able to like shorten the diffusion path lengths between the things that we're trying to pull into the biochar and um and the biochar you know i just think of soil as this you know as you were saying i i, I think erlen you were saying like these uh you know enormous surface area maybe you all were saying that you know and then like how much biochar how large do the particles have to be or how do you distribute it that it's not just putting little tiny islands into the Pacific Ocean of the soil. You yeah, know, that's a that, very that good it's question. It's actually going to be effective. So yeah. um, there are some ways of doing this. You want to have a powdered biochar so you can spread it easily. Um, broadcasting it on the surface obviously helps a bit. Of course, it's better if you can mix it down into the soil. 
maybe plow it into the soil. Uh, there are some, I saw some examples, a uh, European company had developed uh, a way of uh, inserting biochar while plowing fields, uh, which I guess uh, you have those kind of uh, uh, things. And then you also have um, ways to inject it uh, deep into a contaminated groundwater zone. So there are some companies who are looking into using fracking like technology to to kind of um, to vibrate soil uh, or kind of frack the soil slightly to increase uh, cracks and porosities and then to in inject high pressure into uh, into groundwater zone, for example, to stop spread of contaminants. But uh, yeah, uh, it's it's difficult and it hasn't really been tested on really large scales yet, so it's difficult to to know. But of course, to stop uptake in plants, you can to have root zone application, uh, mm -hmm. of course. And the the doses we've uh, worked with here are uh, one percent in the column tests, and we have some big soil isometers going on in Sweden where we have uh, two and five percent and. Uh, we have really promising results. So in a, a agronomic context, biochars are usually applied between anywhere between two and maybe 15 tons per hectare, uh, depending on the soil and what you want to achieve, what kind of effects. So yeah, you need quite a lot, but uh, manageable amounts if you have uh, uh, some big waste streams to produce it from, right? Mm -hmm. And is that like annual applications? Do you are you imagining or what? No, no, every ten uh, no, years the, or something the, like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, so uh, agronomic effects tend to last for. Um, there are not too much data on this, but uh, several planting seasons. I think there are studies that go up to five, six planting seasons where you still see agronomic effects. Uh, the sorbent effect will. Uh, prevail until you kind of reach capacity uh, and then it depends on how much contaminants you have in the soil but uh, if you have enough uh, if the dose is high enough to bind whatever is leachable uh, will stay bound so unless there's more contamination or more being released you don't really have to apply more yeah. thank, thank you, you. Um, maybe one one uh, little addition yeah, Marcel, go ahead and comment yeah, just I think maybe everyone knows this already, but a colleague of mine is also working uh, Jens Leifeld on biochars, and he says it's a fantastic way to um, sequester carbon in the soil. So uh, now I, I I didn't know it. That is also has so, so much potential for for fast, for instance. So this is also something. So I, for sure has a lot of potential. Just get carbon out of the of the air and and fix it. That's not everywhere. Time. I mean, I it, it you know it's not it it depends on so many things. But anyway, just obviously you all yeah. know that. Yeah, in the modern pyrolysis units, you uh, get fairly good yields and uh, stable. If you do this at high temperatures, you get very stable carbon as well. So the carbon storage effect is definitely there. But um, yeah. Okay, let's you, take you a question. You shouldn't chop down trees, though. You should uh, be working with waste streams because it's an offset, right? Rebecca, you have a question. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about the, um, the the contamination pathway, particularly for PFAS, but for many other things. And I, I when I see that adorable image um, from Life magazine of everybody throwing everything away every minute, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff lands up in landfills. And so landfills seem like a, um, a sort of a key node in a contamination in some contamination pathways, and I don't know how, how important that is, but when I asked um, a PFAS expert where could I get some PFAS for some biochar experiments, uh, I was advised to look at landfill leachate as a source. Then I was to find that, you know, you know landfill leachate, you know, has pathways into our, into our world too, and, and I'm worried about that. So I'm wondering if, given that we're not yet allowed to apply um, biosolids biochar to Agriculture is there? Are people trying to implement it as a, a SOP, a, a sorbent site at landfills to sort of block that flow out of the landfill? I'm just kind of curious where you know what's going on with in that regard. It seems like you know, as I think Kate's pointing out, it's not easy to maybe to cover the you know U.S. heartland with biochar, but you know, could we block at least the ex exit of these toxins out of our landfills? 
Yeah, it's very difficult to de deal with the diffuse contamination, right? Um, and pretty much all soils all over the world have trace amounts of PFAS, for example. But yeah, landfills are definitely a big source. Uh, these compounds are so mobile, they escape through the lead shift. So uh, we have a couple of um, waste treatment companies that we work with, and they want to do this. They want to uh, pyrolyze sludge, for example, and use it in their uh, leach, landfill leachate treatment. Or uh, they also want to mix it with contaminated soil in landfill cells. So you're stabilizing the soil ex situ. So then you can mix it as, uh, yeah, fairly easily compared to this widespread soil application. Yeah, so treating hotspots is definitely the most important thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nick. Yeah, I. I just uh, came from a meeting on PFAS and biosolids, so I can tell you <laughs> people are studying it. There's different levels and different pathways and et cetera, right? Um, but as you said, what um, I think in the U.S., you can land apply biochar. There's nobody stopping you from land applying biochar, but nobody's making it. So, you know, this was the issues we asked. I was at this one conference, another biosol conference, and can, people are concerned about the PFAS and biosolids, but it seems like the waste management industry is already working on landfilling. They're going to the cities and giving them, at the same time, all of our urban areas, you know, especially California, which stayed in the Paris Treaty, are trying to stop wastes from going to landfills, right? So, you know, we have all these competing issues. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to, it's very expensive to make biochar from biosolids. Yeah, uh, so the, the movement's going towards landfills and we don't want it to go there. Mm -hmm. But only in California, if you bring, but honestly, what, what you were saying, I think when I think of the three talks here in general, what contaminants, I think the thing, the selling point is it's more than just PFAS. Mm -hmm. It's microplastics, it's PPCPs, it's See, that, that's going to be the thing where um, we tend to look, you know, we're, we're very, uh, that's going to be the ticket where maybe, I still think the biosolids plants, what I'm worried about is they'll just landfill, unless they're in California, because they have to divert their materials. Hmm. Uh, and the, the landfill leachate, they actually do have to collect it, and but then they send it back to the sewage treatment plant, so it still winds back up in the... <laughs> Yeah, biosolids, okay? Yeah, it's a bit of a cyclical issue, as I said, and there's a nice paper from uh, 2020 that kind of shows this, uh, the waste treatment options we have now yeah. are just uh, contributing to further spreading of these compounds as they're not really contained, landfilling in included. So uh, I, I said you cannot apply sewage sludge-based biochars in Europe yet. It's a regular biochar, it's no problem. It's because sewage sludge has all those organic contaminants and also a lot more heavy metals. So it's just a, a lack of data for now. It, it so. depends on which biosolids. Some of our biosolids are very low in metals and very low in PFAS. So That's, we're trying to, right now, we're trying to find sources, control sources. And I don't think we're going to put a ban across unless you're in Maine uh, on biosolids. But, but I think... My point is that we're waiting for people to make biochar here. It's not that it, there's not a restriction to land apply it. There's a restriction in production of it. Yeah, you, you need to and you need it to be uh, economically viable in some right. way, I guess. So you need these kind of integrated solutions. I, I was uh, I just touched upon. So you need companies need to see the potential here. Like there are markets you can. Um, uh, charge fees for for handling waste, and then you can turn that waste into a product you can sell. Then you can you're making money at both ends. So um, yeah, it might take a while, but I, I think these markets are developing in, in Europe, and they might hopefully come your way as well. So uh, we've got some other questions and comments um, here. Let's go. I know Marcel had had his hand up, and I wondered if uh, Matthias yeah. had anything to add to this before we go to the next. Uh, Sam's just, got a question. Just one comment about the biochars. Uh, what I got, I'm not sure, I'm not a specialist in this, but 
uh, actually the, the energy costs are relatively low. Once it starts burning, it's it's relatively neutral. So uh, actually, it's it's just a matter of of getting a demand for it, and then I think industry would actually follow. That's what I got from it, but I'm not sure. You, you probably know much better, Erland. Once mm -hmm. once you start burning it, it produces so much heat that it's so to say a, a self-maintaining process. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the energy investment isn't isn't great. So yeah, it's just a uh, more a matter of investing in the equipment and establishing the value chains. Matthias, do you have any comments here before I go to Sam? I see if we've got a question from Sam. Oh, I mean, we worked on biochar for a number of years, and um, yeah, when we started to wanting to apply it uh, the issue was also that a lot of the waste streams were always already spoken for by somebody and so sometimes it is uh, basically um, a problem to identify a waste stream that's not already taken care of in some way but we used uh, we also worked with hydrothermal uh, with htc uh, that one pyrolysis method that is generally maybe not as accepted as pyrolysis biochar because that can also deal with liquid waste Okay, Sam, I'm finally back to you. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. Uh, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I think uh, all three talks were just thought-provoking, fantastic talks, kind of scary, but at the same time, that's what we signed up for today, right? Um, the, my question is actually to all three of you, because um, after Matthias's talk on this additive effect of global change factors, I was wondering about this additive effect. What do we know? I mean, do we know, are there any studies or if there are no studies, what are your thoughts on speculations in terms of can pesticides or, and there's a range of pesticides, I'm not, I'm kind of grouping them, uh, you know, and there is microplastics, uh, carbon, and there is a PFAS and other contaminants. What do we know? Can these, some of these compounds sort of act together in order to uh, have this, uh, this impact, this negative impact even worsened? You know, are there any additive effects that can further uh, have detrimental uh, impact on soil microbiome and soil health? Who'd like to take that on? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that is basically what our data show. I mean, and the effects are not additive, <laughs> they are more. So I think this is the, you know, the, um, Actually, none of the null models that we applied really predicted it very well. The additive null model for sure did not fit our data. So the effects were not simply additive. They were also not multiplicative and they were also not dominative. I mean, they were not explained by the single most strongest effect either because they were all relatively weak single effects. So I think that the, that the fact that you get like completely nonlinear, more or less unpredictable responses was best illustrated by that soil water repellency response where none of the single factors had any effect. There was a tiny little blip with drought that's uh, actually well known for drought to induce light water repellency in these sandy soils we have around here. Um, but then with five, eight and 10 factors, you have really strong increases in water repellency that was not contained in the information um, available from the single factor treatment. So that came basically out of nowhere. <laughs> that is like the quintessential um, example of a, of a synergistic effect where we don't know exactly what caused that, uh, but that is definitely not additive. That's actually the bad news. Um, another example that um, we had an experiment where we added microplastic to a particular soil and grew an agricultural crop and it had no effect per se. The microplastic the effect was neutral on plant growth. But then we added microplastic together with copper or microplastic together with a pesticide or with PFAS or with something else. And then every time <laughs> microplastic made everything worse even though microplastic by itself had absolutely no effect on that plant. And so that is a is another one of these responses where it's clearly not additive effects. It's uh, complicated. And when you have this, and then we did this with like, you add microplastic and then two factors and microplastic and five factors and microplastic and eight factors. <laughs> and every time microplastic made everything slightly worse, even though by itself it had absolutely no effect. I think this is basically what I'm talking about that, you know, when you look at these higher order interactions and very many factors than just two, you are looking at surprises that you cannot very easily 
glean from information on studies with just one factor or two. Okay. Hey, you have a question. And I would just note that we're getting close to the, the end of the session. So get your questions lined up fast. Okay, Kate. Yeah, I, I, I want to circle back to pesticides um, with PFAS and um, plastics. They've sort of overshadowed you know, the old school, you know, the old fashioned pesticide story. And I, I feel like we didn't think about them for a long, long time very much. And I, I really love, Marcel, that your work of bringing it back into the, you know, the, the into our view. And um, I, I don't think they're taken very seriously um, in the U.S. And I and, but the thing is, there's different pesticides, and it's probably important to know which are the ones that are more problematic than others, but that takes a lot of study on individual ones, let alone in mixtures. Um, but I, and in California, they're now pumping it in drip lines prophylactically. Let's put some miticides and fungicides and let's just, let's just make sure it's all going to be okay. And because um, it's so easy to pump them now through drip lines, you don't even have to apply them separately. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, my main point is, I do you feel they are <laughs> taken more seriously uh, lately in, in Europe? Um, you know, and organic is definitely one solution, but that's not gonna be the only way people can farm. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering where they're going. Yeah, I think Let's each go. of us can answer. I think there are now the European Union has, um, I think they want to reduce it by 50% in 2030 or something like that. I don't know exactly if it's the correct number, but uh, there's very strong political concern about this at the moment. I'm not sure they're going, it's going to happen, but uh, I mean, we have been seeing it for many crops, it's actually very good possible to grow them without pesticides. And I think it's also a matter of making the farmers aware, but I, I fully agree with your point also. Some pesticides, they are just broken down in, a, in, in 20 days and then they're gone. Others, they are persistent and stay for a long time. So it's very difficult to make a general uh, conclusion for pesticides. It's really pesticide specific. And, and then uh, what, what, what Matthias also said is the interaction with other compounds. So it gets very complex, yeah. Erlen, you have a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to that, that um, uh, you're mentioning there are so many different compounds and, and this is a general issue with chemical pollution. Um, we are just barely aware of like a small fraction of the issue, uh, production of new chemicals and release. It's going so fast that we're, we're lagging behind all the time. You know, as uh, for the PFAS, as I mentioned, we're able to prohibit it two of those 5,000, and then uh, production is always shifting away from the ones that are in, in the lamplight, you know? So uh, there are substitutes coming all the time and, and the legislation is not uh, strong enough or not preventive enough, you know? It, it's not, uh, you know, the burden of evidence have to come kind of afterwards. Uh, and this, this is a big issue. We don't have this kind of view where we, we screen things more properly before they're released to the market you know so we're always lagging behind and and we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with chemical pollution this this is something that we're, we're just slowly getting aware of all these different compounds that are circulating in our soils and and our drinking water uh, yeah so and bodies yeah yeah thank you so much we're we're ending we're getting close to the end i should say and i Really want to thank all of the speakers, Matthias, Marcel, Erlen, for your comments and <clears throat> for bringing us up to speed on what's going on. Um, let's see. I've, I think it really is going to help us help the committee address our statement of task. I think that's, and I see I've got hands waving up there, people who wish they could ask questions, but I've, I'm pretty sure we're at the end of our, our webinar here. I want to thank you, everyone who's online, for joining us. And I want to remind everybody that we will hold our next public meeting on Monday, July 10th. And you can find more information about the agenda on that on our study website. Thank you again for attending the session and for your talks today. We really appreciate the discussion. Goodbye, everyone.